a long passage. I uh, attempted to have the whole thing uh, preached today in about 20 minutes, but I was unable to do it, so we're breaking it up into two parts. It could have been a 40-minute sermon, but I just we're just going to do a 20-minute sermon, and we'll just do it in two parts. So I kind of revamped some things. It's tough. It's tough to kind of, I want to extract everything out of it, but I also, I don't, I want to cover, uh, I don't want to be in Genesis for 10 years, you know, so it's kind of tough kind of figuring out how much territory to cover and then, uh, you know, what are the important pieces to, to talk about. So uh, one of the main points that I'd like to make in this episode uh, of, of Jacob's life is that it's an exodus. It's this proleptic exodus. It's very similar to what his children are going to experience uh, when uh, they themselves are exodused out of, of Egypt. We see something very similar. Scripture has lots of exoduses in them. Exodi, exodi, whatever the, the plural is, nobody really knows. Um, this is another one. This is a more obvious one. Abraham is exodus out of, out of Egypt. Isaac is exodus out of Gerar. You could even say that Noah is exodus out of the world in a, in a sense through the flood. There's all these kind of baptisms that go along with it. New worlds are created. Uh, you could even say prior to Babylon that there's exoduses in an opposite direction. You have exodus out of the garden, exodus out of Eden, and then you have an exodus of the whole world. World in, in a sense with Noah and then you have an exodus somewhat with the Tower of Babel but we start seeing these things reverse that these exodus instead of being exodus in a kind of excommunication way that God is reversing it he's bringing people instead of going into death he's bringing them out of death into life and there's this kind of reversal that's happening and we see a lot of these reversals happening uh, throughout the patriarchs we see new Adams we see new Eves we see women deceived Deceiving uh, Satan rather than Satan deceiving uh, the woman, and we see a lot of that here. Also, why why is why is this Exodus or there's new gardens, there's new Adams? Why does God do this? This is a this is a particular way that God speaks to us. It's He wants to tell us something, so it's like here's ten stories that's kind of the same thing, but it's a little different. Five five different ways, six different ways, and then. And then here's a poem, and then here's a, here's a prophet s s with a song, or a judge with a song, and then here's a bunch of laws explaining. This is, this is the way that God speaks to us. It's in this kind of variegated way. Um, it's not, God doesn't sit down and speak to us like a, a, a systematized theologian. It's, it's very uh, Hebraic, <laughs> and Hebraic is just a, a short, it's just another way of saying how God uh, uh, speaks to us. So, uh, so here we are, um, and, and what is an exodus? An exodus is a type of salvation. So this is a way of God speaking to us. He's saying salvation is like this, salvation is like this, salvation is like this. This is, this is a way that God is, is speaking to us. So it, some of the, I want to go through some of the similarities between the exodus out of Padan Aram and the exodus out of, of Egypt. Um, in both, people of God are in slavery. They're in servitude. They've been brought into bondage. In both instances, they serve a wicked tyrant, uh, Pharaoh in Egypt, Laban in Padan Aram. In both cases, they prosper in their, in their servitude. Uh, in, in, in Exodus, they're just, they're multiplying, they're constantly fruitful. Um, and, and it's the same thing here with Jacob. Uh, in both cases, uh, we see that there's idols involved in the Exodus. In this one, Rachel takes an idol out of Padam Aran and brings it to a mountain. And then the exodus out of Egypt, we see that the Israelites are bringing the idols out of Egypt and they form the golden calf. There's, there's idols involved. Um, we see uh, in both instances, there's a covenant made on a mountain. It's Mount Sinai in the Egyptian exodus and it's Padan, or it's uh, Mount Gilead in the Padan Aram uh, exodus. Uh, in both instances, there's a sacrifice made on, on a mountain. We see the sacrifices made in this covenant that he makes with, Pada, uh, makes with Laban. And then there's a sacrifice that's made uh, um, at Sinai. And Moses sprinkles the blood of the covenant on the people. Um, and so there's, there's that covenant-making aspect there. There's also a covenant meal in both. 
We, the elders eat uh, with the Lord uh, on Mount Sinai, and we have a covenant meal here with uh, Laban and uh, Jacob's households. In both instances, the tyrant is conquered. Laban is conquered in a different way than, than the Pharaoh, but uh, he is conquered in a, in a sense. He's escaped from. He, there's, a, there's a border put between him and Jacob. There's a, there's a separation. He couldn't cross it for harm. Um, so in both instances, the people of God are freed. They're released from the bondage of, of the devil, of Satan, of the serpent, of the tyrant, uh, Pharaoh or Laban. Uh, this one is a little bit more loose, but uh, we have uh, 10 plagues that, that come on Egypt. And how many times did Laban change Jacob's wage? 10 times. Um, so the number 10 is there. Uh, there, there might be something to that. Um, also with the, the plagues, the plagues are, um, there's a humiliation of the gods. So uh, it's commonly known that the, the plagues that came on Egypt corresponded with certain uh, Egyptian gods, and they're humiliated. They're, they're, it, God is shown as the true God, and he hum humiliates these Egyptian gods. How are the gods humiliated in the Padana Ram Exodus? They're sat on. Very good. Yeah, that, that's humiliating. The woman sits on the household idol. Right. Very good, Zeke. Um, it, so it shows kind of the silliness of, of, of these kinds of gods. And she says that she, the manner of women is on her, which is a, a, a defiling thing. We're not told that. We know this later in the law. It's likely she's lying. Uh, but that's another kind of, there's a deception going on there of the tyrant. We won't get to that uh, this week. But the woman deceives the, the, sa the snake. Um, so that's, that's going on there as well. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more uh, next week. Uh, also, um, there's an association, I think, with Gilead and Sinai. Um, uh, Paul associates Sinai with Hagar, right? Hagar is a woman, she's the bond slave, and she's the, she's the, she's the slave woman from Egypt. And then um, later in Genesis, we see that there's Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Uh, this is where the balm of Gilead comes from. They have balm. It's when Joseph is in the pit and they see the Ishmaelites coming. They're coming from Gilead. So we see that the mountain is associated with the first woman, the first son, the son of the flesh, the concubine woman. Uh, and this is correspondent to uh, the old covenant and the new covenant, the Jews and the Christians. Uh, so there's something like that with Gilead. Um, uh, oh, we've already talked about this. The Exodus is a type of salvation. Uh, uh, it's, it's a, the Exodus in the Old Testament was uh, f for, for the Jews what the resurrection is for us. It was the defining moment of salvation for God's people. And the resurrection was the fulfillment of that Exodus. Uh, Jesus embodies that Exodus in his life, death, and resurrection. And I believe that it's anticipated in our passage um, because the, there is the, the number three is all over the place. Um, there's, there's the third day is talked about. It's this, it's this word. It doesn't show up in our translation, but it's in verse two. Um, we see this word appear. Um, it, it appears in verse two and verse five. Uh, Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it was not favorable toward him as before. So really literal there, it actually says, Laban's face was not toward Jacob as it was three days ago, or the day before yesterday. Uh, the word is uh, uh, shila, sh, uh, shilashom, uh, and that, is, that has the word, that has the number three part of it. In, in the Septuagint, it's um, ekthes ke treton, a meron, so that, that traiton, that triton, you can hear that tri in there, that three, it's uh, yesterday and uh, three days, so, or in the third day. So uh, we see that there's third day language in here. And if you remember last week, how many days apart was Jacob from Laban? He was three days apart from him. And then uh, we have in verse 22, when is Laban informed of Jacob's departure? It was three days later. So um, 
And then when we have Moses coming to Pharaoh, uh, something that's repeated over and over again, what does he, what does he ask Pharaoh? He says, we, we want to sacrifice to our God and we need to travel how many days through the desert to do it? Three days, that's right, right. So there's three all over the place and I, if a uh, possible explanation is that this is anticipating what, what happens on the third day? What's the, most, what's the most significant event that happens on the third day? Jesus rises, Jesus rises from the dead. That's right. There, this is the fulfillment of all exodus. This is the salvation of all mankind uh, through this. So I think that there might be some connection there. Um, okay, so uh, in verse 1, uh, we're just going to get through about the first half here. We'll get to Jacob getting to Gilead, and then we'll stop. Um, the word of Laban's sons comes to Jacob. And what kinds of words are they? Are they true? Uh, has Jacob taken away all that was their father's? Has he acquired all of Laban's wealth? Um, it seems to suggest that he stole it unjustly. But no, it wasn't unjust, was it? What, what happened? How did, how did he acquire these things? He uh, married his daughters. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's part of it. But who gave these things to him? Who gave, who gave the wealth to Jacob? Yeah. Well, it came from Laban. Yeah, it came from God. God increased his wealth. So it's a yes and no. Yes, he acquired Laban's wealth, but not through unjust means. It wasn't I, this idea of Jacob as like this like wily trickster. It's like, no, he was a good man and God gave him the increase. God gave him the glory, actually. The word there is um, uh, glory, a uh, kavod, um, uh, acquired all of Laban's wealth. You could translate it as abundance, but the word kavod is often translated as glory. We sing it in, in the Psalm 8 song. Uh, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visit him? For you made him a little lower than the angels. And what? And you have crowned him with glory and honor. Glory there, that's kavod. It's the same thing. That's what, his, that's what Laban's son, sons are saying was stolen from Laban. He stole Laban's glory, his kavod, his abundance, his wealth is how it's translated with us. So what do we know, though? We know that this was given to him by God. We have the dream that says, I, I saw what Laban was doing to you, and I gave you the increase. I gave you these things. Um, so what, what is God doing? He's crowning his son with glory. He's crowning his son with honor. Um, uh, in Psalm 8, um, what, what we're singing, it's a reference to mankind generally, but it's ultimately about Jesus. It's this messianic re like dual reference. Uh, and we see Paul quote this in the second chapter of Hebrews. He quotes Psalm 8, and, and it's in reference to Jesus. God became man, the son of man, Jesus, and the father crowned him with glory and honor. So in this sense, in our passage, um, I think this, this glory of Laban being given to Jacob is a kind of messianic reference with the father giving the glory to him. Jacob is a type of Christ being crowned with glory. He's receiving glory from the father. And that's another thing. The word father appears 18 times in this passage. So there's lots of fathers. And there's, there's, there's a bad father, Laban, and his father is the devil. We see that language used in the New Testament. Your father, you, you, you brood of serpents. It's saying you're, you're children of the devil. Your father is the devil. That's what Laban is. Laban is of the seed of the serpent. He's, his father is the devil. He's a bad father to his, his daughters. But there's good fathers. Jacob is a good father. Isaac was a good father. Abraham was a good father. And why was that? Because they all served the heavenly father. And the heavenly father is a good father. He's goodness himself. And the word father is all over the place in this uh, in this passage. And so uh, we see that the heavenly father is good. He crowns his sons with glory. He crowns his sons with abundance. He gives them abundance. In Hebrews, if we extend this a little further, in Psalm 8, uh, uh, Paul quotes the Septuagint and he adds, uh, this is about Jesus, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. So Jesus acquires dominion over all things. And this is what we see with the patriarchs. The, patri the patriarchs are increasingly being given dominion, being given, uh, the, the subjecting things under their feet. Uh, we saw this with Jacob. Jacob uh, uh, we see that Laban was at the foot of Jacob earlier in, in one of the passages. So this is, this is the, these are elements of glory and dominion here. 
Okay, in verse 2, oh yeah, we already, we already went through uh, that. Verse 3, um, the word of the Lord explicitly comes to Jacob. He says, return to the land of your fathers and to your family. And he says, I will be with you. And this is an interesting phrase. This is, this is all throughout the Old Testament. But if you think about this, God's constant reassurance, I will be with you. Um, and if we think about Jesus' name as Emmanuel, God with us. God is with us, but God became with us. Um, there's, that just kind of uh, uh, came to my mind. And this is the opposite of uh, the enemies of Jacob. Jacob's enemies are against him. Um, so the words of Jacob's enemies are against him. The words of the Lord are for him. God's favor is on the righteous, and the righteous hate him for it. Okay, uh, in verses 4 through 9, uh, we see Jacob is a good shepherd. He calls Rachel and Leah to the flock. Um, why is this detail added? Uh, remember, Rachel's name means ewe, uh, which is a, a female sheep. And Leah is likely uh, some kind of cattle uh, term. And so we see that Jacob is the good shepherd over, these, over his flock. And he has his uh, wives there uh, with them. He rightly recounts the situation to them, the Laban's being against them. God is for him, and he instructs him to leave. And then later on in verses uh, 14 through 16, we see that Rachel and Leah are they're like sheep. They're in the shepherd. He calls them to his his, uh, his flock, and they're like sheep who hear, hear the good shepherd's voice. They hear Jacob and they say, do whatever God tells you to do. These are submissive women. They're in agreement and they're not quarrelsome with each other. They're not quarrelsome with Jacob. They're, they're in agreement and they say, do whatever God tells you to do. And uh, we start to see a little bit more of, uh, uh, of what Jake, kind of man Jacob is and what kind of father Laban is. Rachel and Leah say about Laban, he ate up all of their money. The word there is kesef, which is silver. Silver is often associated with slaves or even concubines. Um, and that's what Laban treated his daughters as, as slaves. He was a bad father. And he says, we don't have an inheritance. He ate it all up. He was a Satan figure. He devoured their inheritance. So we start to see that Leah and Rachel are starting to exercise kind of Abrahamic faith in their willingness to leave their, their homeland and to follow their husband to the promised land. Um, also, notice when they do that, Satan... The snake, Laban, took away their inheritance. He ate it for himself. But what does God do? God, God gives them a better inheritance. They follow Jacob to his inheritance of the promised land. So Satan takes away the inheritance. God restores the inheritance and gives them a better inheritance. And so that's something to, um, to keep in mind. Um, God often protects, protects the righteous, protects the upright who are under despotic uh, uh, governments, despotic masters, things like this. We see that there's this dream of reassurance. This is often God uh, uh, fortifying possibly kind of uh, either weak faith or just giving instructions. God, remember Jacob says at Bethel, he says, if you keep me, I will, you will be my God. And this is God coming to him and saying, hey, Remember, remember this episode at Bethel where you, you, you made this vow? I am the God of Bethel. Now come back. Come back to the promised land. And, um, and he, he again uh, uh, promises to, to bring him out. It's this kind of explicit counsel to Exodus out of this, this tyrant uh, foreign land. Um, let's see here. Okay, and then... So, he, so that's what happens in verses 17 through 21. Jacob flees with his people, with his livestock and with his possessions, and he does it secretly. He doesn't disclose it to Laban, and he crosses a river towards Mount Gilead. And if you look where Paddan Aram is, it's, it's in Syria. Sometimes in the Bible it'll say that Laban was an Aramean, uh, and so, or sometimes it'll say Syrian, right? It's kind of northeast of Israel. And he crosses over a river. This river is likely the Euphrates. Uh, if you remember uh, Abraham and Terah, they stop when they're exodusing out of Ur. And they're likely following the Euphrates up um, to, to Canaan. And they stop in Padan Aram. Um, and that's where actually, that's where Terah, and then God calls Abraham out of Padan Aram again. And so um, 
we see he crosses over this river, it's likely the Euphrates. So again, this is an exodus and there's a kind of like a baptism, there's a water baptism moment coming out of this uh, oppressive uh, land. Also, this is the extent of the promised land that was given to Abraham. It goes all the way to the Euphrates and we don't see this actually fulfilled until uh, the time of Solomon. Uh, often the promised land is the Jordan, that's often treated that way, although we have um, we have tribes settle on the eastern side of the Jordan. We'll get into some of that uh, next week. And this is, where, this is where Jacob arrives. He arrives just east of the Jordan River in this place called Gilead, which means rocky region. It's, this, uh, it's about right in the center of Canaan, and it's on the east side of, uh, of um, the Jordan River. Uh, this is the first time we read about the mountains of Gilead in Scripture. Uh, we already mentioned the Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Just a few, uh, a few things here about Gilead, and then uh, and then we'll end. But um, yeah, we already, I already made the connection between Gilead and Sinai. Uh, Joseph's son uh, Manasseh settles in this area, and we also have the Reubenites and the Gadites. They settle in this area as well. Those are the Transjordanian tribes uh, that are in this area. Um, Gilead is the son of a man of war named Mocker. He's the son of Manasseh. He was Manasseh's firstborn. Um, Ramoth in Gilead is a city of refuge for man, uh, manslayers. We read that in Joshua. And then throughout scripture, we also see this balm associated with Gilead. Ishmaelites come with a, a kind of balm from Gilead. Um, we also see uh, Jacob sends a bomb down to Egypt later in, in Genesis, likely coming from Gilead. And Jeremiah talks about the balm of Gilead. He says, is there no balm in, in Gilead? Gilead is often associated with its, its richness. It's a kind of place of, it seems to be prosperous. Um, uh, and just like other places in Israel, it becomes idolatrous and, and um, uh, soiled, but it is, is generally a prosperous kind of place. We also have a few prominent figures coming from this area. There's a judge named Jair. He was from Gilead. Jephthah was another judge from Gilead. And I, there's actually a the, uh, connection here later that I think is between Jacob and Jephthah. We'll get to next week. And then there's a major prophet who comes from Gilead. Anybody know? Jesus? Nope. God? He's, from a, he's from a city called Tishba. Oh. Ezekiel he's a Tishbite. Elijah. Yeah. Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite, Tishba is in Gilead. So uh, those are the, that's kind of the that's kind of the the ski. I spent a lot of time on Gilead, and it didn't really yield very many <laughs> results. But it kind of gives you a little bit of uh, uh, what the Bible says about it. So God promises to be with Jacob. He gives him explicit direction to Exodus out. Um, Jacob escapes the tyrant. He crosses over this Euphrates River, likely. Um, and as we read, Jacob seeks, or uh, Laban seeks to overtake him. And there's this kind of, it's almost a courtroom scene. It's, it's, it, there's actually a lot of forensic kind of aspects to it. And we'll, um, we'll talk about that uh, next week. So uh, let's go ahead and, and pray. The charge is this. Remember your exodus. Remember you've been taken out of the bondage of Padan Aram. You've been saved from the tyranny of Laban, that Satan. Remember that the greater Jacob Jesus, the perfect man, has brought you from life to death. You belong to Jesus, and because you belong to Jesus, Satan cannot make a judgment over you. All judgment for those who belong to Jesus has been carried out on the tree at Golgotha. You are untouchable in Jesus. You belong to the good shepherd and not the evil shepherd. You belong to the good father and not the wicked one. You have been exodused out of sin and slavery into a life of repentance and faith that works by love. You have been taken out of the world and have been brought to Mount Zion. You have arrived at the heavenly Jerusalem. So remember your exodus. Remember the God who saved you, who is saving you, and will save you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord bless you and keep you and protect you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace.